This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Get your hands ready and your knitting needles ready because you're going to be knitting with your brain today, trying to figure out how do different words go together in a creative fashion. Today we're looking at Knitwit. This is a party game from Z-Man Games designed by Matt Leacock, the same one that brought you games like Pandemic and Forbidden Island, Forbidden Desert, and more. It's for two to eight players. It plays in 15 minutes only and it's for ages eight and up. Well, let's take a look. I'm going to show you how it's played and I'll see you on the other side. Let me just show you the box first. This is a really cool idea where it looks like it has a little insert there. And you pull this down, actually there's just the box right here. Knit with a game of loops and spools. And then this actually opens up the front way. And let's take a look at how this opens up and what's inside it. Now when you open this up on the front flap is sort of the rules. This is really interesting because it has like the little steps on how to put things together here. It has the rules of play in this nice thing. Really interesting way to do this. And in here is really impressive. All these spools with this string on them. We have a little book here. I'll get to this later. Here's the cards and then all the, the clips and the, you know, the pencils and the buttons. And it looks really nice. Now the first thing you'll do when you open the game is you'll have to do some assembly. All these had string on them as you saw them. You pull them off and you attach them to the corresponding clothespin. Now you want to be careful because actually my white clothespin was sort of under the insert. It looked like it was missing at first. So if, you're, if it looks like you're missing one, look under the insert. It's kind of stuck and glued in there. But this one somehow got underneath one of the pieces there. But they're all there and that's what you do to start setting up. Now the scorebook is very cool. It's got like it's like a little journal book and you open this up and it looks like an old chalkboard and when you write all the pencils are white so it looks like you're writing on a chalkboard. Awesomely cool design. I love the way this looks. You're going to give everybody a score uh, scorecard that rips off. They're double sided. There's a lot of them here and you give them a white pencil. Only problem I see with this is if you don't have a sharpener close by and these break uh, you won't be able to use a normal pen on this because it's black. You'll just have to use normal paper. I guess that's okay because this does look pretty cool. Now, depending on the amount of players, two through eight, you'll take a certain amount of loops and spools. So uh, for a two-player game, everyone will take three loops and spools and so on and so forth. So people take those and they'll also have some buttons. Uh, you'll take buttons starting with, uh, depending on the amount of holes there are. So for a four-player game, you'll take the three, the two, and the one button and you'll stack them. So the higher number buttons is first. These are going to be bonus points in the game. The game has three phases, knit, answer, and score. Now in the knitting phase, the first thing you'll do is you'll put one of your loops out on the table. At the beginning of the game, there's nothing there, so the first one will just go on the table like this. Then that person will take a word from this word, uh, this word category here, uh, and then they will place it in their clothespin, and this says mean. They will then take their spool, and they will place it in the middle of this. That's just the first turn of the game. The one with the lowest spool will go first, and that's that player's turn. Now going clockwise, it's going to be the next player's turn. They're going to take one of theirs and they have to enclose uh, one loop, uh, one spool only. So maybe they do something like this. Okay. They then take one of these words and they will put it on this one. And this says imaginary. And after they've done that, now a couple rules, as, as, as I mentioned, you can't, when you put it around, it has to be around one spool only, and it can't be put around another clothespin. So they put the word here, and they're going to take the spool and put it in one area. They cannot put it in an area that already has a spool. So in this case, they'd have to choose here or here, and let's say they choose there, and then it would be the next player's turn. Now here's what it looks like at the end of the round. You keep doing that in clockwise order until no one can place another spool. In this case, all eight are being used. Now, normally this would take up more room on the table uh, and, and it would be a little bit easier to see what's going on, but to try to fit it all in a nice zoomed in spot here, I made them really tight. So it might look a little, a little more doubting than it really does on a huge table. So what would happen is you start to score and you say go and everybody has their score pattern. They're trying to figure out and come up with a creative word for each one. For example, we have this two spool here and we can see that this spool, really the only one that encapsulates this is this blue string. It's the only one out here that really goes around this there. And it says mean. 
So I might write an in, and we're trying to do this as fast as possible. Maybe I write Grinch. Now you're trying to think of something that other people will not guess, because if anybody else guesses this at the end, it's going to be worth zero points that will get crossed out. And now we look at this number five, for example. We see this blue ring going around number five, and we see this orange ring going around number five. This green one does not because it's coming somewhere else. So we're looking at, uh, so we're looking basically at orange and blue. So we're looking for something that, that fits both imaginary and mean. So maybe I put someone in here and I say my, uh, my subconscious. And maybe we look at number four and we see that's green uh, and greasy and mean. Now that would, be, would have been a good one for the Grinch, but I already used it. So I could like cross out Grinch here and write Grinch here and try to think of another one because he can't use the same word twice. But in this case, I'm going to say Oscar the Grouch. He's green, greasy, and mean. We look at number eight here and we see it's black and purple is surrounding this one. And so that is tall and greasy. So I'm going to come here and say, of course, the fireman pole. Maybe I get to this point and I'm like, man, I really can't figure out some of these. I, I just want to get some bonus points and be done. Or if you've completed them all, you'll take the top one here and put it in front of you. This means that you can no longer write anything down and they go in descending order. So this one was three, that one was three points. This one's two points. This round will continue until someone takes the last bonus uh, button there and then the round ends. And we go through them one at a time and we find out if you got it right and if you get any points. For this one, I would have gotten nothing because I didn't write anything. The Grinch, I, let's just say that somebody else also said Grinch, so I would not get any points here. Oster the Grouch, let's say I was the only one to say that. And remember, this one was three. It was green, mean, and greasy. And because there were three things, I, I would get three points. Subconscious, uh, number five, we were looking at imaginary and mean. And let's just say I got that right and I'd get two. Now, if, there's a, if, if somebody challenges it, they could say nitwit. And everybody, including the person who wrote it down, gets the vote up or down. If the majority or tie says yes, then you get the points. If not, you don't. Go on to score. Let's say I got this and I got three because I had the bonuses. And so I ended up with a score of 10. The one who has the most points is the winner. Now there's a two player variant where only the two bonus button is used. The first player that is ready and be, to be done takes it for the two points and the other player just gets as much time as they need to write down one more answer and that's it. That, and that's the two player variant. All right, well there is Nitwit. And I know the first question I'm gonna be asked is, is this the next code names? More to that on later. Now, this is, you know, this party game, as you can tell, it has some spatial aspects to it. It has some creativity to it. Uh, it has a speed aspect to it. Uh, I think if you go into this game thinking that it's going to be a very quick, it says 15 minutes, but that's about right, maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Our games were around 12 minutes each when we played this bunch of times. And so if you go into it thinking it's a, it's, it's a more of a traditional style party game uh, with some interesting sort of mechanisms and the way it looks, I think you're going to be uh, very excited about playing this. Now, first of all, production value. This thing is awesome. I showed you the box. Awesome. The spools, uh, the, the, the string, the, the cards, everything, the, the chalkboard, scoreboard. They put a lot of thought into the production in this, uh, and it shows. It really is a thing to show off at the table, much more than any other traditional mass market party type game that you would, you would buy at one of those big box stores. And I'm referring to that because I think this game really fits into that mold. This is really sort of a, a, a take on many of those sort of mass market games. Uh, when I first read about this and I played it, it sort of, for me, feels like a mix between categories uh, and Tribon. Tribon's a game that I played all during the kid where there was, there's three things that, that have something in common. And typically it's just one answer really works. Uh, and so you're trying to figure those things out where this sort of takes that and meshes it with the creativity aspect of categories and the speed aspect and the voting aspect of categories. So I think this really fits into that mass market genre of a game. Now, I did like it. I like the aspect of going around. I like, I like how there's some interesting choices to make as it comes around as to where am I going to put my, my string and then where am I going to put the spool? Like, oh, these two are hard already. Let's throw another one in there. Or let's stay away from that. We had one where they had coarse that came out and everyone stayed away from putting stuff in the course bucket because they didn't want it to be too, too hard. Uh, but then sometimes they put some interesting things together and I think that's cool. It's quick, it's not too too long, but you have some interesting choices in the first half of the game. Then it's a speed game. I mean, it's it's pretty cerebral. You're, you're, you're trying to figure things out. And as people are placing the string in the previous round, people are already looking around trying to think of things, but things can change. You're like, oh, this is cool. This is 
blue and slow. I've got one for that. But then someone messes with it and puts something else there. Now you're gonna think and think differently as things go on. But once it goes, man, it's fast. It's fast and furious. Has that tension like like categories does, where you're trying to write things down as fast as you want because everyone's trying to get those bonus points because these games are always really close. And then you get to the end of the scoring aspect. Now, if again, if you go into this as I'm looking at a, a traditional mass market sort of like party game that has great components, has some interesting twists, I think you're really going to like this game. My parents are going to love this game. This is right up their alley. My wife, who likes party games and light games, this will not be the game for her because she doesn't like making up creative things. So if you do not like trying to write and figure out creative things, this game is not for you. She'll play Mysterium because she doesn't have to be the one coming up with the clues. Uh, sh she'll play other games where you have to be creative as long as you're not the only one you know, coming up with the clues where this one she would not like that so if you're afraid of the creative side this is probably one to stay away from uh, if you're colorblind you might need to stay away from this one because the strings are different colors and if you don't see them well this game will be really hard for you the game's tricky it has more of a spatial element than you would think i mean you're looking at this stuff uh, when we play we actually stand up as we're going because it's the only way you can see a bird's eye view of the table and it's going to trip you up but i think obviously that's designed in to give you a bit of trick it's not just a speed thing it's like you really have to stop you have to focus you have to go okay this one's around this one and around this one and around this one and even when you do that sometimes you'll go so fast you're like oh i didn't realize it was also on that one and that might be frustrating to you at first but once you get used to it it does give your brain it makes you like slow down just enough so you're not just rushing to get the buttons and i like how that is sort of designed in there so overall i think it's a good game i think it's a good party game if you go in it with the right mindset this is a, is a good production value has some thickiness has some creativeness had some speed aspects if you like those you're probably going to like this one if you don't yeah, it might not be the game for you. Now, as opposed to code names, you know, I'm really excited that big name designers like Matt Leacock are, are doing party games. I think even you know Eric Lane's working on one, and many others are working on party games after seeing the success of code names. I don't think this thing is going to be replacing code names anytime soon. That thing has staying power that's going to last forever. I don't know. I don't think this one is going to be one that, that the gaming community is going to be talking about years down the road like they will like they will uh, code names. But it's still a good design and one that I think I'm going to have a lot of enjoyment with my family. Just don't go around and, and open the box like it's going to be the next code names because I don't think it is. But it's still a solid game, one I can highly recommend, and that's Nitwit. This video was sponsored by Miniature Market's Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com.